I arrived in 1972. I came uh, from a place in Prince George's County, Maryland, teaching in a special center, and I also did some work at the University of Maryland. And I came up here actually just to take a look at the place, and there was a vacancy here, and it was for a training coordinator and in special education where they were going to train teachers or were starting to train teachers. When I got there, um, obviously Kennedy was a lot smaller than it is now, but it was, even at that stage, a very impressive place. And it was one of my first exposures to the interdisciplinary interactions of what happens when you're looking and trying to diagnose uh, disabilities of children. I then was taken over to the school and they said, well, here's the education component. And in those days, the education component was really small. It was 13 children. It was on the second floor of the 707 building on North Broadway. And what was interesting, and there were all types of kids in that program. Um, they called some of them dyslexic. Uh, learning disabilities wasn't a, a prevalent term in those days. There was mixtures of kids in there with all types of different emotional problems. And when I first got there, I said, wow, this is really interesting. Having been a teacher and sending one or two of my kids from Prince George's County there for a workup, I had no idea what the workup was like, so I asked, could I go down to a conference and see what an interdisciplinary conference was like? So they let me sit in on one, and I think that's what kind of sold me on a whole bunch of things. I had one of my um, children who were actually had been there about two weeks before. I asked to see if I could kind of have an idea of what it was like when they looked at her and see and uh, diagnose her disabilities. And that's when I got exposure to PT, OT, psychological testing, the medical side, and then the educational side. And for me, it had a lasting impression. I went back to Prince George's County and said, wow, I found a utopia up there. If I ever have a need for a kid to be diagnosed, that's where I'm going to send the kid. Very shortly after that, I got a phone call from someone at the University of Maryland who said, um, they're looking for a training coordinator up there. Are you interested? I said, I don't think I want to go to Baltimore. Uh, and because uh, I had a, a nice setup where I was, and I was gearing myself to be a principal in Prince George's County. I took the ride up anyway, and again, another tour. And by the time the tour was over, for some reason, I said, um, I'll take the position if it's still open. I came to the Institute in 1974 in July. Um, I had been teaching before that in two other non-public schools, the Children's Guild and then the Forbush School, which was at Shepherd Pratt Hospital, working with children with serious emotional disorders. And I was getting married that summer and just seemed a good time for a change and I saw an ad for this preschool, um, head of the preschool. I didn't realize that the preschool was a class. I thought I was coming to look at a preschool in you know, lots of classes, <laughs> that I would be the ahead of. I don't remember much about the interview, but I think within 10 minutes I got hired, like sort of on the spot. And then I found out that it was just one classroom of 10 of the most adorable children you can possibly imagine. All different kinds of disabilities. <laughs> and these 10 children had been inpatients on the third floor for a year, mm -hmm. going home on weekends. And during the week, the five days during the week, Monday to Friday, they would be inpatients and they would have these intensive training sessions with behavioral psychology, teaching them activities of daily living and some preschool type curriculum materials, but not really in a school setting. It was really much more clinical. And then on weekends, they'd go home with their families on Friday and families would bring them back on Monday. Um, seemed a little odd to me and certainly not a typical situation for little children to be away from their families all during the week. So quickly that changed and it became just a day school where the children were brought in. We had some wonderful families, absolutely wonderful families. We had a set of twins, do you remember? Yeah, Vivian sure. yeah. and Claire. Yep. Uh, just really adorable mm -hmm. little ones. And so very quickly the preschool became kind of the darling of the Institute because yes. we, we'd be like myself and my assistant, we'd be like the mother ducks marching down the corridors of the second and first floor with all ten of these little guys following us and it's true we had no playground right. we used to take these little guys and their big wheels and their wagons and everything else right. into the tunnel right. that connected Kennedy and Hopkins that was our playground and so we also used to call it the place where the old beds used to go to retire because they'd be lining the 
corridors of the tunnel, but we'd have our little guys down there with their big wheels and their wagons pulling each other and having just a great time. And so everybody got to know us because we were always looking for ways to get the kids out of the classroom and take them into the community. I worked in the preschool and ran it for about five years, five or six years, after which time I started my own family and said to, to Michael that when I come back, I'd like a different role. And we began a training program, a, a more a substantial training program, writing grants and getting money for training <laughs> program, to bring folks in and to teach them about interdisciplinary education because that was really what was truly unique about Kennedy, now Kennedy Krieger, that you had all these different disciplines, physical therapy, occupational theory, speech language, pediatrics, nursing, behavioral psychology, psychiatry, and education all working together. And that's not an experience that most teachers ever get. They go to their university or their college, they get trained, they get hired by a school system, they're in a classroom, they close their door, they're by themselves all day. They don't really learn how to interact with all of these disciplines that really make a difference in the lives of these children. But Kennedy Krieger was absolutely committed to this and it worked. It worked beautifully. And what I remember most about that time and how exciting it was is that some of the really big names in developmental disabilities yeah. around the world, but certainly here at Kennedy Krieger, we're fellows. We all started together. The Dr. Shapiro, um, Mark Badshaw, Mark Susan Harriman, right. Lana oh. Warren. These were therapists who right. worked with my students in my classroom. And we all sort of grew up together along with Kennedy Krieger, watching it mm -hmm. grow and become the world-class institution that it is today. But back then, we really were a small, very close-knit family that did whatever it took to help these children lead better lives. The school grew from about 32 students until we decided to expand into middle school. At that time we were just in elementary school, well preschool through grade six. We started noticing that some of our kids were 12, 13, 14 right. years old and should not be in elementary schools. And so I came to Dr. Bender and Dr. Moser and other folks and said, we need a middle school, we need to expand. Mm -hmm. And that's when they began to look for property because we had long since outgrown sharing the second floor with the behavioral psychology department. We, ha we didn't have any more space for classrooms. Um, we'd been serving and looking to serve populations of students that the public schools were not yet taking care of. Children with tr uh, traumatic brain injury, children with autism, children with complex medical problems yeah. like tracheotomies, where the public schools were too nervous to have those kids in school. And we were outgrowing our space pretty quickly. And everyone agreed that opening a middle school would be a great idea. And that's when we acquired the Fairmont property, which is now the, the home of our K through eight programs. And when we moved into that building at, on Fairmont, we had over 75 children in the school. And we projected, oh, we think we could serve 110. 110. That was our first projection. Right. I think we were at 150 that first year. Yeah. And before we knew it, we had 200 kids stuffed into that Fairmont mm -hmm. building and we were talking about a high school. And then we acquired the Greenspring campus and opened the high school in, in 2000. So from 72 or 74 anyway, right. to 2000, we grew from 13 students to, now we've got 650 students, seven different locations, we're in several public schools, as well as our home-based programs. Over 400 people work in the school programs, and uh, it's a pretty different place than it was it back is, then. It is, it really is. I should mention, too, that um, we've been fortunate in another way. Um, the leadership of the Institute absolutely has been supportive in so many ways. Way back when, um, I was hired by Dr. Bob Haslam, who, um, it's a, that's a funny story in itself, because I went down, this is when I was making my decision, should I stay or not, and then I found out that his wife, I believe, was a special ed teacher. And I said, well, it can't be bad if his wife is a special ed, he's going to know a lot of the, the things going on. And he, he kind of promised me, he says, look, you'll have the ability to do things that other places won't. It's unique. It's interdisciplinary. So he was there, but after a while he left for uh, another position, and there were a series of other people who came. Uh, a Matt Dubusky, people might remember in the community, who was a, just a really well-known pediatrician and a wonderful person, but unfortunately he passed away shortly in his tenure. 
Hugo Mosher came again, and, and what's fascinating there, Hugo and I became friends because Hugo came from um, working at a state school and others besides Boston Children's at Rentham State School in Massachusetts. And I also did a stint in Massachusetts, two or three years teaching in a wonderful place next to Buzzards Bay, Mass, but I knew all of the areas of where the kids were coming from, and he was the superintendent of that program. So we formed a little bond there, so he was supportive. Then that changed in a while, in a while we wait for the entering of Dr. Gary Goldstein, which was fascinating because everyone was saying, well, who's the new guy going to be? And Gary came in, Dr. Goldstein came in, and I remember we had a meeting, I hope he remembers, but I'm sure he does over at Cross Keys, where he was interviewing everyone. And he was saying, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. So I basically told him a little bit about myself, and he asked me what else, what I thought we might want to change, and this and that, and I kind of said, not too much. I'd like to just, let's see what's going. We've got Robin, we've got myself. We, we had great principals. Nancy Smith was a principal. Mm -hmm. We had great principals and great staff. We, we prided ourselves in picking the right staff. And I didn't know what way he was gonna go. I said, well, after the meeting, I actually went home and told my wife. I said, well, I've either killed myself, so get ready and we'll pack, or we might stay here another few years. Um, 25 more years. Uh, I guess because Gary Goldstein began to look at the situation and recognize too, which I think is that education was such an important component of the Institute, that he became immediately supportive. And I, I say that even though I'm retired, so that's a real important thing to say. Uh, you know what I think really contributes to that is that um, aside from the school, the rest of the institute, the research, the training, the service that they provide was all very world class. Yeah. And I think we recognized that we needed to create an education program that world was world class, class also. And so right from the beginning we were focused or right. hyper focused on making the school the best possible representation of what special education could be for the students, for the teachers. Absolutely. And, um, and I th I'm not sure that would be possible any place but at Kennedy Krieger where we were surrounded by that same dedication to the yep. highest quality of everything. That first or second year I was here, we decided to have a bake sale. Remember all the bake sales? Oh we used to have bake God. sales in the lobby. Every this, day. You know, now we're so corporate, we don't have bake sales in the lobby much anymore. But we had this bake sale in the lobby and all of the parents in the preschool uh, were uh, several of them were connected to a particular church, and the church was going <laughs> to do all the baking for us. And I remember, too, it must have been some economic or, or situation where sugar was being rationed. Yes, there were rations was. for sugar back yep. then, and that sometime in the 70s. I, can't, I don't remember why, which is amazing, but I don't. <laughs> what I do remember is that we stumbled on the idea to have this bake sale the, week before, the weekend before Thanksgiving and to take orders for <laughs> pies. We made about 800, and people would say, oh, bake sales don't make any money, don't waste your time. $850 we made at that bake sale. People were in line out the, the doors. door in the lobby coming in to buy everything that we had to, to sell. And that was the first, then we had lots of bake sales for the All school. the time. If it weren't for the parents, just like any movement, if it weren't for the parents, the program probably wouldn't have existed. They had to feel that we were helping them or we were providing something that they needed. So I just thought I'd throw that in because on occasions I meet a parent. The good news is um, it's a parent that I really remember a little bit until they tell me that they weren't the parent, it was their parent who I met. So we go generational here. That's the other thing that's mm -hmm. so incredibly important about Kennedy, that we see kids over long periods of time or relatives or whatever and I'm always amazed that when we, when we talk or I've talked with them over the years they always highlight a positive thing. I think that the, the thing that was important to the parents was that for many of them this was the first time their mm -hmm. children participated in things yeah. that other kids did whether it was the Christmas program or the little play that the classrooms would put on, the end of year celebration of everybody's accomplishments, or um, parent day, or parent-teacher conferences, where for the first time they were being told positive, nice things about their children instead of 
fearing the phone call from the school that was going to tell them, you've got to come pick your child yes. up again. They, they're in trouble again. And we weren't about that. We weren't about focusing on what the kids couldn't do. We were really focused on celebrating what they could do. And for many of our parents, that was just such a unique experience for them. They couldn't do enough for us. And they would, yeah. it didn't matter what we asked, what we needed. The parents have always been there. Um, in our corner, getting us what we need. And even now, our parent association is extremely active. Um, mostly, they're raising money for specific things, whether it's uh, increasing technology in the classrooms and putting Promethean boards in every classroom, or uh, helping us fund a playground or a new van for the school, or whatever it is. And it could be something really small too, like the parents come in every twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring, and they put on teacher appreciation activities, whether it's breakfast for all the staff where the parents are there making it and serving it to staff or at the end of the year. Um, and it's a wonderful relationship. And I think it's because they genuinely understand that the kids are happy and the staff is committed to being there for those children and their families first and foremost. The population of students that we serve in the school has changed a lot over the 37, 38 years that we've been here. And it's changed partly in response to what the public schools needed us to do. When I first came, we had children with much milder disabilities, much milder learning problems. And at that time, That's as Dr. Right. Bender said before, with the passage of Public Law 94-142, which we now know as the IDEA, or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the public schools were then mandated to include these children in public school classrooms. And so what they did was they began programs for the milder, the students that they felt they could be the most successful with, and turned to the non-public schools to serve the students that they were struggling with. And so it made sense that our population would become, become more complex uh, with a lot more uh, complicated disabilities, multiple needs. Students who came to our school didn't just need speech therapy. They needed speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, counseling, and maybe nursing services for a medical problem. All things that were difficult for the public schools to put together. And so our population began to change. And then I think in the late 80s, maybe mm -hmm. early 90s, we began to serve our first students on the autism spectrum. Yes. We started with one classroom, then it was two classrooms, then it was four classrooms. Today, 65% of the students in our school are somewhere on the autism spectrum. And so we had to shift our curriculum focus to include communication and social skills, because that's really the hallmark disability or hallmark deficit that children on the autism spectrum have. So we, when we created the high school especially, but this is true in our K-8 program as well, we spend a lot of time thinking about what is it that makes a school a community? It's not just a classroom and a teacher. It's how all those classrooms interact, how the teachers interact. When we moved from Broadway and opened Fairmont for the first time, we had a cafeteria, Good. we had a gymnasium, we had a library. I mean, the <laughs> heart and soul of a school. We didn't have a library mm -mm. at 707. When we were at 707, we have great memories and we loved it, but it really was going to school in a hospital. Yeah. When we moved to Fairmont, it was as if the school finally arrived. came into its own and arrived, and now we had a school with mm. a playground mm. and uh, many classrooms and the ability to give kids social experiences that were very normal. And we wanted to do the same thing when we opened the high school. And we have really uh, gone above and beyond to find ways to have things like student government, mm -hmm. a prom, letter jackets. I remember when we first introduced letter jackets, yeah. the kids didn't know what they were. Right. What's a letter jacket? So we went to the staff and we said, anyone who has a letter jacket from when they were in high school, next Friday is letter jacket day or letter sweater day. And everybody wore them and you know to tell the kids, this is how I got my letter, I played this sport or I played that sport. And we started an intramural sport Great. program with the other non-public schools. And it grew so much that we've had a few of our students who leave our school in the afternoon to go back to their home school to play sports. Uh, so we really began to focus on the, uh, the social aspects of what makes communities out of schools and give the kids as many normal experiences as possible. One of the things that makes us different than others is that we're not afraid to take risks on a lot of, in a lot of areas. 
I remember that we had seen uh, and got referrals for a couple of kids who were over at the hospital at Hopkins who had trachs. And they were young ones, little preschoolers. And we walked over there and I remember we looked at them and I think we said, why isn't that kid in school? You know, why, we're, we're, well, and they said, because he has a trach. And we said, what difference does that make? It's a medical problem. So we made a decision and we said, we'd like to have kids with trachs come to our preschool. The existing administration at the time, way before Gary and others, looked at us and said, are you kind of crazy? That's a high risk thing to do. What if they stop breathing? What if they stop this? What if they stop that? And who is going to clear the trachs and who's going to do all of that? And I said, well, the teachers can be trained and some of that will have nurses. And I, again, we said, and who do you think does that at home? I mean, we're not talking about a certified nurse in every home. It's mom or grandmom who's doing it. So we took those kids into the preschool and lo and behold, we began to notice other kids with trachs across the state began to be entered into preschools. So we feel we were, quote, a pioneer in that area. That was one. Uh, our kids participated in an engineering competition down in D.C. that they have, it, they have them every year. At that time, what they had to do was they had to work with a scientist, and we got someone from the University of Maryland yeah. to be the scientist that they work with. They had to build a robot that would play basketball. And then they had a basketball tournament and they had to, and the robots would compete. So they had to learn some programming and they had to build this robot. The robot had to be able to pick up the trash ball thing and, you know, go and deliver it into the basket. And our robot actually won the, the tournament. The amazing thing was <laughs> where our kids fell down and came in, they didn't come in first or second, was when they had to explain to the panel how they did what they did. Because language problems are at the heart of the, the, the types of deficits that our school kids had. But we had a great time with the Lego Lab and they did, they built uh, a Mars rover and participated did. in the Mars rover project where they were watching live feed from the Mars, Mars rover while they were directing their little Mars rover robot thing to go around. And we, they went to many competitions and all kinds of experiences that nobody really thought these kids, could These kids do. with disabilities could do. And that's on the, the more academic or intellectual side. But on the more fun side, one of the things we did every year that people thought we were nuts. Oh, yeah. We would take the entire school camping. <laughs> yeah, right. And it would always rain. Always rain. Always rain. But here's, here's what I'd like to say about that. We've had kids, <laughs> braces on their legs, who have never walked, who have never gone out in the wilderness and at that time we had a oh. unbelievably wonderful physical yeah. education oh, teacher yes. Buzz Williams yep. he hiked five and a half miles with a kid a CP a kid with cerebral palsy in braces on his back to give that kid the experience of what it's like to hike in the woods I have one more story to tell this probably was again back in the maybe the early 80s and I'm not exactly sure how the connection between us and the Make-A-Wish Foundation happened. Oh, yeah. I don't believe that it was for a child who was terminally no. ill in the school. I just think no. somehow we got connected with the Make-A-Wish Foundation and they offered us, and, and we probably had about maybe 50 kids in the school at the time. Right, right. 50 or 60 kids in the school. They offered us one day yes. round trip to take kids and staff to Disney World in Florida. Now these were mostly, at that time I think 75% of the kids in the school were from Baltimore City. That's not true today, but at the time it was. So most of these kids had never been to an airport, let alone on an airplane going someplace else. And staff, of course, were very quick to volunteer for this trip. 24 hours, they got on a plane at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning, flew to Disney World in Florida, in Orlando. Um, these are things which today, I'm sure, would make our risk management office uh -huh. cringe and uh -huh. lose sleep. Yep. But back then, we just did it. Um, took all the kids to Disney World, didn't lose anybody, got back home about midnight, and had the most wonderful day. I'm sure kid, the kids on that, from that group remember it to this day. I hear this from everybody. Everybody's comments on what a happy place it is and how Everybody seems to be enjoying their job and liking what they do, and there's just a real warm, good feeling. Somehow, 
between 1974 when I came, or 72, mm -hmm. and 2012, we've been able to maintain yeah. that feeling, even though we've grown you know, exponentially, we're much bigger, we're in multiple locations, but still, when you go into a Kennedy Krieger program, you get that same warm feeling that everybody here is just so happy to come to work every day. And that doesn't mean we don't have our challenges, especially these days with ec the economy the way it is. It's very challenging, but still, it's one of the most fulfilling places I've ever worked. Not that I've had that many jobs, because once I came here, I stayed. <laughs> but um, it's definitely what's kept me here all these years, is just this feeling that everybody is... Um, working to a standard that is unbelievable mm -hmm. and with a dedication to, to serve the families and children that is, you just don't find it any place else.